the assignment. The most important factor for you is that one, the date. First week of January. Um, and I will schedule the usual 10, 12 minutes in my office during that week. So that's, a, that's the end of the Monday, which is a bank holiday. And so it'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday will be the date when I will be seeing you all. And of course you'll get marked then and you'll get close to the final uh, grade mark subject to moderation and so on. Uh, normally doesn't change, so the, you'll know the answer not two, three weeks later after you submit it, but before you leave my office. The actual final draft review is during the week of the 28th or 31st, no, 28th or 1st of December. So that's around about week 10, I guess, actually, 9 or 10. Well, we've already looked at that bit. Okay. Now, a little starter point is that John, I think we mentioned in ITSM last year, I can't remember whether those who were out on placement came across it in ITSM the year before, John Easton's uh, comments about big data. The fact that 80% of all the data around us is of uncertain veracity. In other words, not that 80% is wrong, but 80% of the data, we don't know whether it is right or wrong, and if it's wrong, by how much it is wrong. And the same goes with all of the data coming out of the uh, Internet of Things, sensor networks, location services on here, and so on and so forth. So the theme is what is the impact on corporate and information governance of the reliability or unreliability of big data and data from the Internet of Things? Lots and lots and lots of big companies, and I'll probably be at the IBM World of Watson out in Vegas last week of October. There will be probably seven, eight thousand people attending the conference from big customers around the world. All trying to do things with big data analytics uh, to find out whether they can improve the effectiveness, the productivity, the profitability, competitiveness of their companies using big data and analytics. One of the questions that doesn't get asked very much is what is the impact of that 80% uncertainty or veracity problem in terms of the governance, the value, the insights that are gained from all of this big data? If we cannot be certain that data is accurate, what are the questions we need to ask ourselves so that we don't fall into big, big uh, traps? So out of this scenario, you will each have to think of, look for a really good scenario. There's lots and lots, and we'll talk a bit about them in uh, another session, of all of the types of data. And then you will have to work out a good governance strategy that an organization will need to put into place if they're going to obtain value from the data. Whether it's a farm using um, sensors on the necks, hanging off the necks of cows, or Acceler uh, Google um, cars, for example, or all the various different types of autonomous car systems that are being built nowadays, are they going to be effective? Will they deliver the safety that everybody is claiming they will? Or are there very fundamental reasons why they will be effectively no safer than human drivers? in the long term, or the short term. Or if we're looking at social media, are there problems with the data we get from Twitter and Facebook about things? We know that with all of the hotel review websites, 
that there are some really, really serious problems of data there. Some of which comes from pure human nature. Like, if we're happy, why should I tweet? It's what I expected. I might, if I'm really hacked off, go and tweet or put a po adverse posting up on Trivago or whatever the, they are. I know, we know, we've known since 1985 and beyond, a happy customer will t maybe will tell three people. An unhappy couple, uh, person will probably tell 10 or 15. So you've got this enormous skewing of sentiment. You've also got problems that the sentiment um, for one hashtag may be the same, may be confused with a sentiment for a slightly different hashtag, which is completely different. And there's a lovely example that came out of a SAS analytics conference a couple of years ago, where in southern Africa there were there was a one bank, and I forget which bank it was, was going just getting into um, its social media analytics. And they were having to do an enormous amount of handwork before they could do a bit of SAS-based analytics uh, sentiment analysis. And it turned out there was a little bit of a problem because up in Zambia, there was a rhino or a hippo, I forget which it was, which, was having, which caught the public's um, interest for some reason. And its name was the same name as the product that the bank was actually promulgating. And so they had got two sets of social media input and they had to sort of look at them, is it a rhino or is it our product? Or you're trying to connect together um, your bank or you're an inv investment company and you're a mortgage company and you decided you want to not just use the credit history for John Smith, but you also want to connect to John Smith's social media to see whether he's really as good as he claims to be or is. In Britain, how do you determine that a Twitter account is connected to the John Smith who is your guy who was born on such and such a date and lives at such and such an address? How do you do that? Or Johann Schmidt or whatever in Germany, and this is a current one there. there were, and the problem there, the governance risks are huge. If you connect the wrong data together and then um, either give a loan to someone who isn't really credit worthy or that's your risk in terms of you probably won't get your money back or you decline a loan because you picked up some erroneous data from out there that you've relied on more than the repayments profile you're at risk of a, a lawsuit perhaps you're certainly going to get major problems with your reputation. So this is what we're looking for. Find individuals. So we've got 22-ish, 23 perhaps, people here. I want 23 different scenarios. Because this is going to be leading edge. Not many people are working in this field, so you've got, once again, the opportunity <coughs> to really kind of open up the field and then that will help me because I've got conferences coming up where I'm talking about this sort of topic. And the companies I, uh, conference people I'm attached to uh, in the telecoms, the retail, manufacturing, uh, software testing and other areas, they're all the data science or chief data officers and so on are interested in how do we avoid making pro uh, pitfalls for ourselves. I want you to be able to help me with that and all those who contribute to it will get your names up there on the, um, the, the credits. You will be able to put that into your CV. And if we're lucky one of you might volunteer uh, for next year to next term to edit the whole lot, at least those that do more than 70% and with a bit of luck, we'll get 16 or 17 of them above 70% um, that will be published, and that's another credit you get. Now, and the, the point here, of course, is that I want you to become more expert and more knowledgeable than me. 
because there's 21 or 22, 23 of you, you can spend a lot more time between the 23 of you than I can. And then that helps build your reputation, my reputation, and that of the University of Derby, which is kind of cool for everybody. As always, I give you a bit of a structure. The first section is all about setting the context of what you're doing, the type of industry, the type of data, or whatever it is that's relevant, um, and what sort of impacts there are with that information in a positive and a risk kind of set situation. Then use an appropriate framework to identify the governance issues that are raised by this project. And you'll be linking into things like information uh, governance, you'll be linking to uh, ideas like <coughs> the fact that humans are inherently over-optimistic about the success of their projects. And I'll be expecting you to think about reading books, a book by a guy called Daniel Kahneman, which is called Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's about how we make stat judgments or we sit back a little bit and think it through a bit more logically, a bit more critically, and come to a long, uh, more considered understanding. And he talks about a whole range of fallacies that humans have. And one of them is a planning fallacy, which goes along the lines of, yeah, we know that in the past most projects aren't successful, and most of our projects have not been successful, but hey, this is going to be a successful project. Yes, I know it's a slightly challenging time scale, a slightly challenging resource profile, but we will manage it hard, and we will enthuse all of you, and we'll be on time. And we get surprised. Once again, it doesn't come in on time to budget or delivering the expected benefits and so on. So you'll be looking at a range of different sorts of governance approaches, governance frameworks that are relevant to your particular context and topic and type of data. And having done that, so you've identified your governance issues in the framework, then you'll move into the really meaty part. Using your frame, governance framework that you synthesize, it can include parts from different frameworks, so you don't have to just stay with 27002 or some whatever, or PRINCE2 or whatever framework you want. Cherry pick based on the risks that you can identify the really interesting pieces of governance from wherever that come together to form a way of getting success for your project. And what you will deliver is nice and simple. Using the Springer LNCS template, which you've all used now, I think, just about, most of you have anyway, um, excluding the front and back and everything else, from the start of the introduction to the end of the conclusion paragraph, six pages, plus or minus a little bit. Plus zero, so it must, in your original Word document, finish no more than the end of page six, or no less than a couple of lines. So you've got to fill it up without fiddling the formatting. I'll catch that at the formative review. And as you'll see, the penalties are very severe for missing that two, that two line um, limit. And the reason for the very severe penalty for missing the length <coughs> is because it replicates what people like Winnie and I have to do. If we are putting in a paper for a conference presentation, it will say six or eight pages. And if you go over that by one line, they come back and say, Richard, Winnie, would you like to pay $100 for that extra page? Or it could be in the real world, not so much you guys on that, but people who are doing forensics uh, uh, that you'll come across next term in ISA, they have to use their template perfectly for their input to court.
and in many other areas, and some of you out there in your place in here, had templates for doing various things. And if you don't use those templates properly, in the right way, the right lengths, it just gets bounced back to you to go fix. So there's a very, very tight limit. You will then have wrapped around the introduction to the end of the conclusion, a front page with a title and where you, your, your accreditation details, you know, University of Derby, blah, 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 email addresses, um, abstract keywords at the front, and table of contents. And then after the uh, conclusions, there will be a bibliography, which is of unlimited length. However long you want it to be, you can have it. <clears throat> and the bibliography, of course, is those sources that you have cited, not the reading list. I'm not interested in your reading list. I just want those sources you cited to justify what you have been writing about. Use the chapter headings for, and, and as appropriate, and then subheadings and sub subheadings. So use the headers one, two, and three religiously. And in LNCS, um, there are buttons which do the heading one, heading two, heading three, and also does the body text as well properly for the whole set of paragraphs. Now, when you look at the guides to using the Springer LNCS, there are two things you will change. One is you will use Harvard citing and referencing. You will not use the numeric referencing that Springer actually normally requires. I want that because that is the standard for a lot of other publications in the computing uh, sort of field. It's also, for me, a much more useful form of citing to see the names and the year rather than one, two, three, four, five. If I get numbers, I've got to look at the bibliography and I'm not going to bother to do that. So I think. So I want you to use Harvard citing and referencing, and I want you to use English spelling. Springer tends to require American, so make sure your PC is, or word processing is using English spelling. Single word document. So you'll need to ensure that at the end of your key, keywords, or so end of your, not keywords, end of your table of contents, you give a hard page break, control enter, or insert page break. And the same at the end of, at the end of your conclusion paragraph. So don't use enter, 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 line feed, line feed, line feed to get onto page, because it goes potty. There is always, already, and you know this, most of you, that um, Turnitin is not terribly good at creating its version. So when sometimes, don't get worried folks if it happens to you, you've got it in Word exactly to the end of the page. When you put it into Turnitin, suddenly you're three, four, five lines over. Do not worry, because I will see your Word document, so that's what you submit is the Word document, and then I can go back and check that and you'll get a little note that says no page penalty or no length penalty because Turnitin has messed up. So I check that. Week 11 because of, is where you're going to get your formative review. So that's going to be pretty close to the standard most of you would have submitted at the end, a week later at the end of term. And what you already know, folks, is that the formative review you get there actually adds between 5 and 25% to your grade. Because you then have over Christmas to clean it up, add a bit, develop the, th the ideas perhaps a bit more, uh, and to fix all of those irritating little problems you had with the formatting. And that really is a mandatory one. That is the one that actually fixes your grade, it seems. Much more important that you come to that than almost anything else that happens. That's what the data tells me. Midnight of the 2nd of January 2017, that's when you must submit it, and then I'll see you and I'll be publishing the timetable sometime between the 3rd to the 8th 
of January, which is exam week anyway. Now the grading, how is it going to be marked? Now, most of you have already been through this, so you know that you will be providing citations and uh, references in the bibliography and so on. But just as a warning, if there are no citations, then your overall mark for the whole thing is capped at 35% as a sort of referral, which is not very helpful for you. Now, like always, 20% of the grade for the assignment comes from perfect adherence to the standards of writing in LMCS and academically. So these are the weighting factors across the top. These are the various mark levels you're going to get for the different factors. And it's kind of cool if you actually do put the numbers in here, which are out of 100, not factored by the weighting. But if you do a really great one, 100, 95, 95, 95, or 100, whatever. Let's have a look at the formatting <coughs> ones first. So on the title page, you can lose, if you're really good at doing things badly, you can lose 30% of your formatting. That's six points on the whole grade. If you don't use the right... Um, Formatting buttons for the title, subtitle perhaps, your name, your email address, the University of Derby, etc., etc., um, abstract, keywords, you can lose marks quite rapidly. Formatting errors if your headings one, two, and three aren't properly done, you lose 5% for each of the styles that don't, haven't worked properly. If you don't use adequate and consistent um, Harvard standard citations, uh, you, you lose up to 20%. 10% just for having too few. So if you've got five or six or seven citations, you're liable to lose 10% there, just because you're not supporting your arguments very well. Um, and the same goes for the referencing, where there's clear formatting required there. If you don't use the body text style, that means your paragraphs aren't starting properly. Uh, it might be you got the wrong font. It might mean you got the wrong font size. Minus 15%. Page length, that's a rather tight two, uh, two lines. You can lose 50% there. And if you don't use a template, you lose, I think it was 100% of, of that. So you've lost 20 marks if you don't bother to format properly. If you don't use LNCS at all. Now, it's not actually difficult to get perfection there. And the reason, the justification for a lot of this is that whichever of you volunteers to edit this lovely collection into a, an e-book is going to be spending a lot of time as editor fixing all of this lot. So these deductions are kind of related to the amount of effort the editor is going to have to undertake to try and get it back up to standard. It also gives you a nice start. If you've got all the formatting and the spelling and grammar and everything else sorted out, you know, you've got 20% in the bag before you got started, just for perfection in your presentation. And that's one of the things that employers actually look for, is the fact that you can present your information effectively and to the standards. And I know uh, all these templates are a little bit broken because word templates are not very reliable. Tough. Winnie and I have to use three, <coughs> four, five templates a year. Yeah. Lots and lots of different templates which are all broken in different ways and before we submit we have to put it into perfection. Otherwise it just comes back not even considered. And, you know, it's, it's a waste of time and effort. I remember one occasion I tried to cheat and I got a, a quarter of a page over the length. So I thought, oh, I'll adjust header one, header two, and header three spacing a bit. And then 
A little bit later, after my paper had actually been accepted fortuitously, I got this message, Richard, um, <clears throat> you are actually half a page, I think it was, over. Do you want to pay $100? No. So then I had to re-edit it to get that, to reclaim that half page of words. Same will go in your professional lives often, guys. Three areas that are going to be assessed, for 20%, for 30%, and 30%. So, the introduction section, and these give you a bit of an idea about word count you might want to put into those three chapters. And here are the, is the wording that helps you to understand how to target your work to get the highest possible grade. So critically and comprehensively, meaning lots of perspectives, lots of sources, compare, contrast, synthesize. And oh, I thought I got rid of that. I had to do a little bit of modification. It was, I thought it was all right. Let's just check what's on the next one. No. It needs a slight change. It's not location, so it's a bit big data analytics and so on. That's bizarre. It was right yesterday, uh, Friday. Save the wrong bit, perhaps. <clears throat> anyway, in there, read the um, topic of the um, assignment. So, what are the impact and potential benefits? Is there a clear and logical structure to the analysis and justification? Is there a professional level of understanding? And novelty. It's not there. You can't go out and find the answer directly on the internet. It's something no one has ever thought of before. You're connecting ideas from over there and there in ways that haven't been connected before. So, and then you can go down all the rest and see the differences starting at 95, 85, 75, 65, and so on. In terms of evaluation of the governance issues, again, this critically and comprehensively evaluating and justifying the governance issues and the frameworks. Ah, there it is. In terms of the incorporation of big data and internet analytics in the business, and that phrase there, should be um, there. I missed that, I'm sorry. And then the governance strategy proposal. This is the kind of the answer that you're leading your reader towards in the context that you have chosen. You're applying the frameworks that you've created in your context critically comprehensive evaluation and justifies the government strategy proposal. This is what should be done. There's strong, clear, logical structure, professional level understanding, novelty, synthesis. Then two pieces of uh, that we're using to provide what I like to call externality. In other words, I'm linking the assessment of what you do not to outstandingly clever and brilliant, which is kind of it what the rest of it is, but this says, actually, if it's a 95% one, then it is good enough to be, for you to go and publish it at an international conference. And actually, fortuitously, we happen to have one coming up here in January, the week after the assessment, um, here at the University of Derby Big Data Education um, Conference. So that's one that links to how academics, moderators, understand quality, because we all know what sort of thing can be, see, can be uh, submitted for an international conference. And then the second one relates to what you will be doing out there in the real world in around about 12, 15 months. The Skills for an Information Age uh, framework. And 95% is the level 
or the two levels of the Sophia, which are creating strategy and inspiring, level seven. As we go down, <clears throat> this, the 85% is publishable at a national workshop, that's sort of a university in the UK. And it's initiating and influencing strategy in a business. Now, remember, this is create a strategy. So a good one is going to get one of these three levels with a good luck. Seventy-five percent university research symposium, and we have one here in the in University of Derby sometime next year. And Sophia level five, which is enabling and advising. Sort of stuff that most of you were doing if you're on a placement last year. You should have been working at least at level five, and possibly not at level six, but certainly level five. Then 65% is Sophia level four, which is competent business analyst. And almost all of you on placement would have at least been working at level four. I want you to get your game up a bit higher than that. 45%, sorry, 55% oh, is 2-2. Two, two. And that is junior business analyst level three, applying policies that are already written. I suspect any of you who were on placement and effectively been promised a job at the end of the year probably were working at at least level four, if not level five, Sophia. The pass level at 45% is trainee business analyst, assisting kind of working with someone, uh, not a lot, lot of initiative, but kind of just about okay. And the 37%, which is the referral level, is Sophia level one, need constant monitoring and looking after and hand-holding all the time. And I guess none of you want to be there next year. Now, because we've got these external factors built in, I am confident that the marking that you will get through this will not be subject to uh, normalization and shuffling at exam board time. I've been doing this now for the last three years and my use of business analytics or learning analytics shows that uh, this is what's happening. It leads to very, very high um, levels of achievement some of, the, my, some of my modules using this and using this approach lead to some of the highest pass rates um, and achievement levels in the university. So the chances are that if you work well with this, do the research, come up with some key ideas, and then use this rubric to find topics which drive up towards this level, like I talked about in the uh, Intro to Computer Science a couple of years ago with some of you, you can find both a really cool topic, really great topic that is novel, and working with you during the workshops, um, the other session we have, looking at what you're doing, you can question and answer with me or uh, Winnie, you should be able to get yourself right up there, all the way across the board, certainly to the 75% and above. One other uh, warning for everybody who's forgotten, I only mark these three at the central point, the 95, the 85, 75, and so on. You get a little bit of spread because of the weighting factors. And the reason for doing that is that it's quite tricky to answer the question, why have I got 82% and I think I got 87%? My response to that is, wrong question, folks. The question you should always be asking yourself is, how do I get from 75 to 85? How do I get from 85 to 95? Or 45 to 55? Asking how do I get from 48 to 51 is not a helpful question. It's easy to, for you to tell the difference 85 and 95. It is easy for me and Winnie to tell the difference 85 and 95. Anywhere else. And the externals like it. So don't fuss about it, folks. 
my learning analytics tells me all of these things. It gives me confidence that this way works. And you will succeed. You will do well. And I expect, as I say, about 16, 17 of you or thereabouts to get 70% and above. You can find the details of the Sophia framework there. Um, what I would suggest is that you actually sign up for yourself. It's free for an individual. Get hold of that brochure there. And because it's going to be quite useful for you over the next year, as you kind of do yourself a skills audit that builds you up uh, evidence or helps you to build the evidence of your skills and how, why you can claim level 5, level 6, level 7 for each element that you want to look at. And it'll help you to think about your future. What sort of job area do I want to go for? Now, it's a pity that Sophia doesn't include analytics, um, but the debate when they released the new version, or were debating the, the new version of Sophia, was that, well, it's already, all the aspects of analytics are, and data science are already included in other aspects that are already in Sophia. But Sophia is very useful. Many of you, if you start looking at the jobs market, will discover that many of the jobs are advertised with Sophia framework references. So that will be helpful to you as well. That's why I've also connect, so I've connected this year the assignment um, rubrics to um, Sophia, because it, it relates to what you're going to be doing next year. OK, folks, any questions about that? OK, well, when we get back together Thursday, yeah. Um, then we'll start working on that, on your assignment. Start thinking about the types of areas you want to build into your assessment and assignment. Okay? Thanks very much, folks. Thank you very much. <clears throat>